So um, I'm, my name is Wes Neutron. I am the agriculture specialist for the Columbia Heights Public Schools. Um, my main project is working with Blooming Heights, which is our edible schoolyard garden and outdoor classroom. Uh, so uh, I'm going to do a little presentation today about uh, what Blooming Heights is, like what type of an urban garden we are in Columbia Heights, and then go into a little bit about um, how to start a garden. And then we'll take some questions after that. So um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, can everybody see that okay? All right, wonderful. All right, so as I said, my name is Wes Neutron. Uh, just a little bit about myself uh, to give you some information about my background. Um, I grew up on a farm in rural South Dakota, so I'm a farm kid. I've been around plants and farming um, my entire life. Um, and, you know, so really took an interest in that in terms of uh, career. I went to school for soil science and worked in that field for a while before I found my way into um, education. So um, in the Twin Cities, I guess my educational background starting at uh, Eloise Butler Wildflower Garden as a naturalist. Um, so giving tours and teaching people about um, wildflowers and trees and plants uh, in that garden, in that beautiful garden. If you haven't been there, it's a hidden gem within the Twin Cities and I highly recommend it. Um, and after that, I worked as a teacher at Dodge Nature Preschool um, in West St. Paul. So we uh, worked with three to five year old kids getting outside into the woods every day and using nature as a, as a lens for learning. So that was, you know, a real um, awesome outdoor classroom experience there. And then I was excited to move into this position I'm in now as an agriculture specialist. Um, and to run the schoolyard garden and outdoor classroom at Columbia Heights. So a little bit of a history about Columbia Heights and you can see the picture there, that's a aerial view of the garden. If you haven't been there, it's tucked behind the family center, uh, the district offices and the high school um, at Columbia Heights. Um, it's very well protected back there. It's kind of its own little ecosystem because the heat the sun warms up the bricks and it keeps it probably at least a zone warmer back there. So we were, you know, getting the rhubarb was out of the ground and, you know, ready to harvest uh, by the end of, I mean, li like literally some stalks like six inches tall still in March. So, you know, we had a pretty early spring in Blooming Heights this year. I know everybody had a little bit of an early spring, but I was, I was astonished really. Um, anyway, a little bit of the history, the funding for Blooming Heights came from the SHIP program or statewide health improvement program, um, grants and um, in-kind money from the public school from Columbia Heights. Uh, the first garden was planted in 2010. So 11 years ago, May, um, Blooming Heights got its start. Uh, and the agriculture specialist position, which I am in was created in the fall of 2012. So we're getting on almost 10 years of having a dedicated agriculture specialist working with teachers and students um, to do education in our um, outdoor classroom. And we always like to say that Blooming Heights has the classroom is the classroom with the most beautiful ceiling in the district. Um, and I, I think that's probably hard to argue with that one. So, all right, so getting on, um, our mission at Blooming Heights is that Blooming Heights is a Columbia Heights public schools program that uses school garden and nutrition programming to facilitate equitable experiences that engage all the senses while building the skills and knowledge necessary for cultivating a healthy life and planet. And these are our guiding principles. And I just wanna say our mission statement and our guiding principles were put together um, by an advisory committee, including teachers and students at Columbia Heights. So this is the voice of the school. Um, coming through in our mission statement and our principles, which we're really proud of. Uh, we are committed to hands-on teaching and learning that highlights beauty, wonder, and joy, and encourages positive risk-taking. We are truly an outdoor classroom, and we really want to 
lean on that. It's been difficult with COVID and uh, distance learning because that hands-on part is a little bit harder. You know, through Zoom, we've been able to do, you know, send some things home with students for certain classes and do activities uh, through the computer, but, you know, really haven't been able to do what we fully hope to do this past year. But students are back, some students are back, and we're able to get students back out in the garden, and we're really happy about that. So um, we facilitate interactions with the natural world that are both the value both individuality and mutuality. We provide professional development and support to educators involved in experiential education. We conduct practice-based nutrition curriculum built on the belief that healthy food should taste good and connect eaters to the earth. We teach garden skills and knowledge as a lifelong means for self-advocacy and independence. Uh, we seek to center marginalized voices and to elevate leadership from all members of our community. We provide opportunities for personal and cultural connection with the land. And we'll get into that a little bit more in the um, presentation. We believe learning should feel relevant and urgent, inspiring questioning and curiosity. And we offer multi-age, multi-discipline learning experiences that utilize techniques such as social emotional learning and mindfulness, as well as academic content. So, you know, the garden is, is uh, it's the lens through which we can really teach any subject and students experiences there go beyond just the content of what they're learning. You know, it has to do with being outside, getting that experience of learning outdoors, um, that, social, that social emotional element um, and mindfulness as well. All right, a little bit about the scope of Blooming Heights. Like who do we, who does Blooming Heights serve? So we serve the district all the way from early childhood up to adult community education, right? So here's just a few of the, you know, if we break that down a little bit in early childhood, we have ECFE, um, which is early childhood family education, early childhood special education, pre-K, Mini Adventures, which is a um, uh, preschool age childcare program, and Glitter Bugs, which is a summer rec department program. Uh, elementary, uh, K through five at Highland, Valley View, and North Park School for Innovation. Um, all the elementary schools within our district. Also, Adventure Club, which is school age childcare um, that happens after school and also in the summer. Uh, summer Encore, which is a summer after school program. Um, and the middle school, which is Columbia Academy, high school, um, obviously uh, Columbia Heights High, but also programs within um, the high school, Anchor, Special Ed, Encore, which are after school programs. We also have four high school students who worked with us last summer as paid garden assistants, and we'll hire another four high school assistants for this summer. Uh, we have special education classes. Um, Adult classes, like I said, Metro North um, ABE comes out to the garden and community ed classes. And then we also maintain partnerships with uh, community experts, um, Aaron Roop from Pollinate Minnesota and we've worked with Spark Y in the past. So just a little bit about like, what does a year in the life of Blooming Heights look like? So what does our program in our little urban garden look like um, throughout the year? So starting with spring, um, we need to do spring cleanup right away. So that's kind of where we are right now. We're still doing some spring cleanup. We've got some bed prep, some uh, planting, all kind of happening, happening simultaneously out in the garden right now. Uh, but preparing garden beds, um, digging, adding compost, um, irrigation lines, mulching with straw. Uh, we're planting the garden beds and we're trying to do this all with our students as much as possible. They're out there to learn lessons, but we're also trying to integrate uh, all the processes of maintaining a garden with the students um, when they come out uh, to visit. Uh, scheduling student visits with teachers so that the big part of the job, making sure the teachers know that we want them out there and we want to get their students out in any way we can and scheduling with them. Uh, sometimes teachers just bring their students to the garden on their own to do their own lessons, and that's great too. So it's a it's a space that's you know open to all of our teachers. Um, it's also open to the public. So just know that 
uh, you're welcome to come to Blooming Heights and visit. We've got picnic tables there. Um, and it's a beautiful place. We just ask that people not pick things from the garden since we use that all for educational programs. We donate uh, to SECA, we donate to the community. Um, we uh, share food with our cafeteria to share with students. So there's a lot of destinations for the food in the garden. Um, and then also in spring, we have some encore after school programs. Right now, this spring, I'm teaching a after school program for high schoolers called um, Food Justice Club, and also one called Outdoor Club. So um, it's great to have some students out uh, learning those things this spring. All right, in the summer, we have summer school programs that we do. It's a busy, the garden is a very busy place in the summer. Um, in addition to that, we have Adventure Club and Mini Adventures, which are our, our child care programs in the summer, and they are coming out every week. Uh, Glitter Bugs, that Columbia Heights Recreation Program, they come out every week as well. Um, garden maintenance is done with the help of the high school assistants, but also with the help of Adventure Club students. Whenever we want some additional help, we can just go and um, ask some students to come out, and they're usually eager to come pick berries, um, plant some things, um, just get outside and do something different. So uh, seasonal fruit harvest and preservation, we're picking a lot of berries and putting them in the freezer and getting those ready uh, so we can do nutrition programs in the colder months. Um, summer farm stand with Adventure Club students. In the past, we sold some of the produce out of the garden. Uh, last year and this year, our plans are to give produce away to the community. So we actually have some dates on the calendar that are in the um, community ed catalog um, where residents can come and get free produce from the garden. Um, acknowledging that, you know, this pandemic's hard on people and uh, there's been, you know, we have food insecurity right here in Columbia Heights and we want to do what we can to help address that. So, um, the, as I said, the high school assistants working in the summer, they're working on special projects. And also they're gonna learn, be learning about pollinators this summer, which is super exciting. We've got a lot of pollinator initiatives going on in the city this summer. Um, the mayor's Monarch Pledge. Um, we've got uh, the program we're doing at the school. Um, Rotary Club is working on some pollinator initiatives. And uh, we, what we plan to do is train our high school students to be pollinator advocates. So they can go out in the community and tell residents about pollinators, their importance and what they can do to protect them. All right, fall in the garden, we're obviously harvesting. That's a big part of it. Um, providing produce to food service, uh, donating uh, produce to SECA, preserving a lot of the, the harvest, um, student visits with teachers. Uh, in this photo, you can see uh, some photography happening. We get a lot of art classes out in the garden, which is wonderful. You know, we're not just teaching gardening. We're, te we're using the garden as a lens, right? Um, and literally in these pictures, these students are photographing the beauty of the garden. Um, drawing and painting classes come out and render what they see in the garden. Um, even ceramics classes have come out to dig clay out of the garden and take that clay, refine it, and make little finger pots from the clay in Blooming Heights, which is, is such an amazing project. Um, so those are just a few examples of some of the lessons um, we teach in the garden. Uh, you know, there's uh, science lessons, math lessons, art lessons, um, really any subject can be taught at Blooming Heights. Uh, encore programs again happen in the fall and then putting the garden to bed. And then in the winter things, you know, we get covered in snow. So things get a little bit less active outside, but it doesn't mean that there's not things to do. So um, one of the big things one of the big responsibilities of my job through Blooming Heights is helping out with the K through five American Indian programs. So these are lessons that are taught to all of the children in our um, K through five classes and all three of our elementary schools. Uh, they have programming they're doing with their classroom teachers. But in addition to that, I'm visiting their classrooms, um, bringing in some additional content that's more food related. So typically we get to make wild rice and learn about wild rice and learn about um, something uh, relevant to um, the American Indian uh, experience. And this year we weren't able to make wild rice in person. We had to do things virtually. 
So we were able to order uh, Tonka sticks, which are made on um, Pine Ridge Reservation by um, people from the Lakota tribe. And uh, so we were able to support their business and get a Tonka stick for every uh, student that was involved in our programs. We got to taste these buffalo um, beef stick or buffalo meat sticks uh, in our lesson. So that was really fun. Um, we're planting the garden in the winter. We're ordering seeds, starting seeds. Um, we do cooking and nutrition programs with a lot of the food we preserved in the summertime. We have winter encore classes, a lot of scheduling for spring programs, writing new curriculum because we always want out that part of the, our guiding principles, learning being relevant, right? If we want to stay relevant, we have to update our curriculum um, and have new curriculum to uh, keep up with um, demand for the times. Uh, building and developing relationships with teachers and teacher partners. This is really important to like make my job easier so I don't have to like email everybody every spring and every fall to schedule out in the garden. It's ideal to build those relationships. So we're always talking and they're ready to come out as soon as um, ready. Uh, we're pruning the orchard in the winter. And uh, this year was the first year we tapped a maple tree. So this is really exciting working with the uh, kids to tap a maple tree and um, we didn't make, we didn't have enough to make maple syrup, but we uh, made maple tea, um, which was super fun and got to drink some of the sap. All right, so um, in keeping with our guiding principles, it's really important for us at Columbia or at Blooming Heights to cultivate a culturally diverse garden program. Um, important for us to acknowledge that our uh, student population is very diverse. And we need to speak to that cultural diversity. We need to speak to that in the way that we're doing our programs and the way that we're planting our garden. Um, so what does this look like? Uh, planting seeds and growing foods that represent the various cultures of our community, right? Um, so, you know, I said, I grew up on a farm in South Dakota. We're planting a lot of seeds that I didn't even know what those foods were when I was a kid. Um, and that's great. Like. Um, we want to represent, we want to be able to, when we're harvesting that food and we're doing cooking programs, we want to be able to make recipes that come from different cultures and be able to use that food right from our garden, right? Uh, Encore Food Justice Club. Um, we talk a lot about um, food justice is basically uh, social justice in the food justice system, or the, in a food system, right? So tackling uh, issues of inequity within the food system. Um, all the way from farming to uh, harvesting food um, through the way the food is distributed in our country, um, food deserts. There are a lot of food justice issues that we're able to uh, touch on in our Encore class. Um, and you know, one of the things that we try to do as an activity is we're growing food, right? That we then can give away to the community, right? So I think that's an important social or food justice action that we do at Blooming Heights. Uh, we have garden signage in multiple languages in the garden. This was a special project of one of our high school assistants last summer. Um, you can see in the picture uh, that is um, a squash called Gete Okosamin, um, which translates to big old squash. Um, and you can see squash is in English, but also Spanish and Ojibwe and Dakota. And then most of the signs also have a Somali translation. We weren't able to find a Somali translation for squash. Um, so we also um, value cultural representation in our curriculum, right? I acknowledge that I'm a white man and my perspective on gardening isn't the be all end all, right? There are many perspectives and it's important to reflect our student population. So we're learning through books, videos, um, giving credit and learning from uh, names within um, the various cultural communities that make up our uh, district. And I also wanted to say, you know, it's important to do that because farming and gardening in our country is premised on whiteness, right? Um, like I said, I grew up on a farm in rural South Dakota. When I uh, pictured a farmer in my mind, the only person I could picture was somebody like my dad, a white man, right? But the reality is there are 
farmers throughout the world. Um, in fact, the vast majority of the food in this world is grown by black and brown people, not by white people, right? Um, so, you know, I had a misconception of where food came from. I thought, I'm a farmer. I know where food comes from. It comes from the ground, right? But I was a little bit misled as to like, actually where and who grows that food, right? So that the majority of the food that comes from the grocery store, our fruits and vegetables are grown and harvested by people of color, right? So this was some relearning that I had to do. And I think it's an important thing to acknowledge, especially in a school um, where we value our cultural diversity. All right, we also uh, honor indigenous farming practices at Blooming Heights, acknowledging that Blooming Heights exists on Dakota land, right? Um, and that the plants there, the native plants in our garden, uh, the plants that are native to this country, they've known their indigenous names, their Dakota names, their Ojibwe names for far longer than they've known their English names. Um, and acknowledging that in our curriculum and to our students, right? Um, we plant a three sisters garden in Blooming Heights, which is corn, beans, and squash. This is a garden that has its roots in um, multiple indigenous cultures. Um, talking about like this, the symbiosis of the mutuality of the corn, bean, and squash. The corn grows on a hill in the center um, and it provides a support for the beans to climb up. Um, the beans uh, turn air into nitrogen in the soil and feed the soil. And the squash spreads out over the soil and protects the soil from um, excessive weed growth and also uh, preserves moisture, right? So this is indigenous science. It's been along for, around for a very long time. Um, and we wanna acknowledge that in our garden. Uh, we teach principles of the honorable harvest. Um, this is something I learned from Robin Wall Kimmerer who is uh, Potawatomi. She wrote an amazing book called Braiding Sweetgrass. If you haven't read it, I would highly recommend it if you love plants. Um, but she talks about a contract that we can have with nature um, where we ask permission before we pick and we only take as much as we need. Um, we never take more than half. Um, we leave a gift for what we harvest and we always say thank you, right? So we're trying to teach these principles to students who come in the garden and harvest. Um, I mentioned our American Indian program um, earlier and some of the resources, um, we have great local resources for indigenous farming pra practices. Dream of Wild Health is a youth led program based out of Hugo, Minnesota. Um, urban youth get to go out to this garden in Hugo and be part of the whole process of growing food, harvesting food, eating food, bringing that food back into the community and selling it all under indigenous leadership. Um, and Natives, which is um, the project of uh, the sous chef, um, also uh, has a um, project called the Indigenous Food Lab, opening up a restaurant in downtown Minneapolis this summer called Awamni. So it's super exciting. If you haven't heard of Natives or the sous chef or Awamni, um, Check it out for sure. Uh, and we wanna acknowledge the agricultural contributions from communities of color. Like I said, um, farming and gardening in the country is premised on whiteness and we wanna change that. We wanna open up people's minds, open up people's perspectives to the contributions of all people toward uh, farming and gardening. Um, as I mentioned before, the vast majority of food grown in this world is grown by people of color. Um, some of the resources that we use for education, uh, Youth Farm, which is a local um, program uh, that gets kids in the city out farming. Uh, farming While Black is a wonderful book. Um, it's written by Leah Penniman. She's, um, her farm is called Soul Fire Farm in Albany, New York. Um, they do amazing work um, in various books, websites, Instagram accounts, TED Talks, online presentations. I have a link to a Google sheet. I'm just gonna throw in the chat and if anybody's interested in looking at um, in looking at that, uh, you can click on the link. Um, and you know, you don't have to look at it while we're talking, but you can simply open it up. It'll stay open on your browser and you can look at that, um, after the presentation. So, all right. 
And I just want to acknowledge like, you know, permaculture, regenerative agriculture, community supported agriculture, pick your own gardens, all these things get a lot of buzz, right? But I want to acknowledge that these things exist because of the contributions of people of color, right? The ideas of permaculture come from indigenous farming practices. The ideas of regenerative agriculture come from indigenous farming practices. Community supported agriculture and pick your own uh, farms was an idea that was pioneered by Booker T. Watley in the mid-century um, at Tuskegee University. So just giving credit where credit is due, right? Like I had no idea. I knew about all of these things, but you know, in my mind that was steeped in white, this farming whiteness, you know, I'd never imagined that these were contributions that came from communities of color, right? A lot of learning to do. All right, we're gonna switch gears here and talk about um, urban gardening. So if anybody, many of you maybe have a garden already. Um, I know there are people watching on TV as well. So um, just wanna go through four things to know about starting a garden. Um, first thing is when, when do you start a garden, right? This is really important and it's gonna depend on where you live in the world. But right here in Minnesota, um, in the Twin Cities, they generally say that you should not put transplants in the ground until after the last frost date for Minnesota, which is May 15th, right? And some seeds you probably shouldn't plant in the, until then either because the seedlings are so tender. Um, when they emerge and if they emerge quickly, they could frost and you just have to plant again. So, um, and as for seeds, uh, it really depends. April 15th, um, or depending on the plant, you know, some, uh, for some seeds, it's as early as you can work the ground, right? So that really depends on the year. There are some really hardy vegetables like the brassicas, like broccoli, kale, cabbage, um, radishes, peas, lettuce, spinach, other greens are really hardy. So you can seed those early. If it frosts a little bit, they're going to survive. They're just going to hunker down and wait till it gets warm again. And then there are some seeds that you want to plant a little bit later, like corn, beans, squash. Those are more tender. You don't want those to freeze because then you just have to replant. Um, and you know things like tomatoes, peppers, eggplant. Um, those are ones that ideally uh, you start indoors and transplant outside. And then there are other um, other crops uh, fit the other category: garlic. We harvest or we plant that in the fall, and it comes up in the spring. Um, or you can plant in the fall. You can also plant spring garlic. Um, and then there are fall crops, like crops that you plant in the late summer to harvest in the fall, right? So different planting schedule there. All right, another one of the, the uh, thing number two to know about starting a garden is where, where to start a garden, right? So if um, you can start it outside at your home. If you're lucky enough to have a backyard, you can plant a garden in your backyard. Um, if you have a balcony or a porch or a deck, a person could uh, plant in containers um, in those spaces as well. A lot of plants, garden plants grow amazingly in containers. In fact, some grow better because you can contain them, right? So certain plants like mints that love to spread, you know, you can keep them contained a little better in a container. Um, so yeah, you can do those things outside in ground or in containers. Um, community garden plot. Uh, for people who don't want to have a garden in their backyard or don't have a backyard or don't have access to space where they live, community garden plots are an option. Um, and I'm not super well versed in the community gardens of Columbia Heights. Hopefully we can talk about that a little bit in our question time. Um, I live in Minneapolis. Um, so I'm still getting to know uh, the community garden situation in Columbia Heights. Um, but that com community gardens usually uh, require fee, right? Um, but also indoors, a person can start a gar garden indoors um, under grow lights in windowsills. Um, one of the people I follow, she's a Somali uh, farmer, um, and she has uh, an Instagram called Naima's Farm and is working on starting the Somali American Farmers Association. Amazing woman. Um, she wanted to start farming didn't have access to land and she started growing herbs in her bathroom. That's how she got her start, right? 
So a, a garden can be very small and it can be very big and it can grow into something much bigger as well. Some considerations here with starting a garden, land access, we talked about that. Um, land access is not always equitable, right? So if we're thinking about how we uh, move toward a more equitable future, we need to be thinking about how we can expand land, land access to more of our community, right? How can we have more community gardens, more space for gardening um, and make that accessible? Um, another consideration is con soil, con soil contamination and I misspelled that, I apologize. If you're gardening in your backyard and your house is from the 50s or before that, uh, it's very possible you have lead in your soil, right? A person could test their soil for lead. Lead tests are kind of expensive, but you could also build raised beds and bring in clean, healthy soil that you know is not contaminated and grow your garden in raised beds. And this is a good way to make sure you're not eating vegetables that have been contaminated by lead, right? Um, that's really important, especially for young children. They're not getting excess lead in their systems. Um, also, container gardening is a great way to get around uh, soil contamination. Thing number three to know about starting a garden, where to buy those seeds and plants, right? So I like to go local whenever I can. So some local seed companies to talk about, there's one called North Circle Seeds. This is a pretty new seed company. Um, they're based in Minnesota. And um, they have, they specialize in seeds that are acclimated to Minnesota weather, right? So that's great if you want hardy garden plants. Um, so we're planting some North Circle seeds in Blooming Heights this year. Um, and another company that I just became aware of called Experimental Farm Network or EFN Seeds. And they're actually based out of Philadelphia, but it's a, it's a project um, with multiple people. And one of the people involved in this project is from Minnesota and actually just opened a garden center in South Minneapolis called Agrarian Seed, right? And they sell these seeds at their garden center. So I just wanted to give a shout out to that new business um, that's, that's local and doing a lot of great things with seeds. Um, Seed Savers is based out of Decorah, Iowa, but they have a lot of great heirloom seeds. Um, and we like to support them as well with Blooming Heights. Um, and also just going to your local garden stores. They have lots of wonderful seeds there as well. Uh, transplants, if you wanna buy transplants, some great places that I like to talk about. The Friends Plant Sale happens on Mother's Day weekend every year. Um, and they sell a ton of plants at the state fairgrounds. Uh, the money um, goes to the, the friends and um, the, the, the prices are really good, right? You can get really affordable plants at the Friends Plant Sale. Uh, Mother Earth Gardens, they're in Northeast Minneapolis. There's a Mother Earth Gardens. It's really close to Columbia Heights. They have wonderful plants there. And also I love to go to farmer's markets. There's always plant vendors at farmer's markets in the spring um, selling really healthy, wonderful garden plants. Uh, another thing I wanted to bring up on the subject of buying plants is uh, neonics. Maybe some of you have heard of neonics. It's an abbreviation for neonicotinoid insecticides, right? And I just want to make sure that people know that they should make sure that their plant providers are not using these insecticides on their plants. Some nurseries use them because it uh, cuts down on like aphid and um, might damage in their greenhouses as they're starting these plants, right? So they can be more profitable. Uh, the downfall, the big downfall is that these pest or insecticides are systemic. Once they get in the plants, they never leave and they kill all insects. So it's possible you're buying plants for a butterfly garden from a plant provider who uh, sources from a nursery that uses neonics. And you're planting poisonous plants or plants that are poisonous to butterflies in your butterfly garden. I don't think anybody intends to do that, right? But there's not a lot of information out about this. So always ask the people who are providing the plants where they got their plants, and if they know if they had been treated with neonicotinoids. I think it's a really important question as we're trying to prioritize pollinators in our community. And the last thing about uh, knowing how to start a garden um, is how to maintain it. 
Um, you know, one thing that's always hard are the pests in a garden, right? I mean, there's always going to be that. We are gardening, right? We're, I just told him, I said, look, I said, when the guy comes up, you can go talk to him. If you feel uncomfortable, then you. Uh, all right. So for the sake of pollinators and human health, try not to use chemicals, right? So this is one thing I really, we really prioritize in Blooming Heights. We don't use chemicals there. Everybody, you know, sees things differently, um, but pesticides, insecticides, fungicides have a negative effect on pollinators, animals, and, and humans. So, um, and, you know, instead, pull weeds by hand. It's good exercise, handpick insects, um, uh, grow healthy soil um, to combat plant diseases. And the way we like build healthy soil is by adding compost to boost our fertility, to boost the microbes in the soil. We get more worms in the soil. Um, and that really helps to make a healthy um, soil environment um, and really cuts down on diseases as well. And lastly, um, water. While rainfall is great, some plants need to be watered in the summer. So always be monitoring to make sure your plants aren't getting too dry. Um, with that, I'm gonna stop the share here and open it up to questions. Les, it looks like uh, we have a comment in the chat from Kathy, if you can see that. Yeah, generally, if a grower or garden center does not know if their bedding plants were grown with neonics, then assume they were treated with neonics. I think it's a good, that's a, uh, a good um, tip, right? Uh, people who are not using neonics are, prou are really proud of that fact. Right, and and they're typically going to know if they have if they have. So some of your big box stores, you know, if you're asking, you know, employee at a big garden center, they just may not know. And you can always seek, you know, an opinion from. You can ask if they know somebody who does know about that, you know, um, to get more clarity on that. But generally, if you can't get an answer, just assume that they have been. That's a good way, a good way to be safe with it. Thank you, Kathy. All right, take any other questions, but also I wanted to, you know, when I was talking about um, community gardens, I was just wondering if anybody in our group has any good resources for community gardens in Columbia Heights. Yeah, I know we have uh, Veronica Johnson here and, and she, uh, yep. she might have some information on a, on a community garden. Well, the, the community gardens on Jackson and 40th are run by Mary Tokes, Tokes who is, is one of the members of the Community United Methodist Church, and she um, works them. They just, obviously, the city just finished uh, tilling it, and she was going over there. She said it was a little cold today, but tomorrow she was hoping to go mark off all the different plots, and anybody who'd be interested in volunteering could give her a call. Great. Do you know if they have openings at that garden, Veronica? You know, we talked about it today, and I didn't even ask it. I will. Huh? Hi, hi Connie. Oh, uh, hi. oh Veronica, do you want to uh, do you have, uh, yeah, Veronica, you want to continue? Oh, okay. Oh, just was going to say is that um, somebody could give her a call if they wanted to volunteer, but as far as, as knowing whether there were plots open, I'm not sure. I, 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 I would say that there were a couple open though. If somebody wants right. to contact her, I can give you her phone number. Awesome. Do you want me to put it in the chat in case somebody wants it? Yeah, that's great. In case somebody wants it, just throw it in the chat and then people can see it. So okay. thank you, Veronica. I will. I can, uh, as far as the community gardens, there's two others. One is up on the hill by Crestview off of Reservoir. And that for signing up, um, if there are any plots left, that goes through Park and Recreation um, Department, Deanna or an, another staff person can help with people. Sometimes like last year, they had a few plots left and folks, it's still good to check in to see if there are any left. They can also put your name on a waiting list and they'll contact you if uh, one, if uh, plots are left or two, I'm up there, I've got two plots and I keep an eye on stuff. If people don't start planting by a certain time, like uh, middle of June, and they're just, and it's just sitting there growing weeds, 
they can lose the plot and we can assign it to somebody else if they want it. And the other garden, it's not a community garden in the same sense as Mary Stokes or the cities, and that's the food forest we have over at Lomiaki Park, the Blooming uh, Sunshine Garden. Um, we're in our second year of planting. We, um, it's a garden where people can come help with weeding, mulching, planting. Um, and what it is, is it's a garden that's set up for the community where once things are ready to harvest, we'll be letting folks know through our Facebook page, the Blooming Sunshine Garden Facebook page, and they can come and pick for what they need for their family. Um, and uh, we have we planted a bunch of fruit trees last year. We also have a, um, oh, I can't think of the type of nut, hazelnut bush, and we got some raspberries started. And we'll also have some annual things like tomatoes, peppers, squash, um, different types of herbs that we've already planted last year. And they're more than welcome to call me. I can't see my chat on here. So I can just give my phone number. Uh, they can look me up. I'm in the council, but um, it's 763-788-5072. They can call me and I can help them. We'll be meeting on Thursday nights again this year, starting at 6 p.m. at the garden. So they can just show up and we'll put them to work or we'll let them harvest, depending on the time of summer that they show up. But it's a really cool place. And I encourage people to come check it out and help out if they want, or come walk around and check out the new plants. We got uh, grant money from us, uh, Noka County last year. So we have a podium sign that's going to be going up explaining what the garden's for. We have a podium for our pollinator garden and we're setting up a pollinator nursery in that section on the berm. We're going to have like 10 to 12 different plants that can be used to raise different types of butterflies and moss. And so those will be examples. Plus we'll have little, we have little signs that we got through the grant that we're going to post information about what parts of the plants are eaten, you know, when you can harvest all that kind of stuff. Uh, to be used. So it's it's a really cool project that folks can come check out. Thank you so much, Connie, for sharing. That's amazing. You're welcome. Thanks. That's, uh, I don't know if you saw, but there's a, a question. Uh, Raquel would like to do some permaculture of berries and apples in her in, in my yard. What are some good native fruit trees? All right. Thanks. Good native fruit trees. All right, so um, let's see. A lot of the, you know, you know, a lot of the fruit trees that, um, you know, like apples and pears, um, are not native. Um, there are native plums. Uh, there are native cherries. Um, in terms of like fruit trees, um, that you know we can grow here in Minnesota. Um, but nuts like hazelnut is is a native um, nut producing tree. Like big trees like black walnuts and butternuts, but those are probably a little bigger than what you know. And uh, trees in that family um, kind of discourage other. They have an allelopathic effect on the soil, so they kind of discourage other garden plants from growing. So I don't necessarily recommend that for somebody's yard. Um, but uh, also think of like berries, right? So like June berries, um, currants, raspberries strawberries are all native um, to Minnesota and, and native to the Midwest. So um, those are some great native uh, ones that I'd recommend. Um, yeah, as far as apples, you're, uh, you know, they're, they're apples um, originally come from Asia. I think there are some like a native crab apple, um, but you know, not like a line that uh, you know translates to our modern apples. So, all right. We have Adam from the MWMO here. Uh, Adam is uh, uh, class next week with the library, uh, planting for pollinators. Um, we're still looking for uh, more people to register. And Adam, you want to tell us a little bit about the class? Sure. Yeah, and um, I just want to thank both you, Will, and and you, Wes, for setting this up and for inviting me along. Um, and also Wes for providing all that great information. It was, um, I learned a lot during this. So it's not just not just me here plugging the uh, presentation I'm doing next Tuesday. So um, yeah, so next Tuesday uh, via the Anoka County Library System, <clears throat> um, I will be doing a presentation just about how to start small plantings in your own yard, um, mostly 
geared towards pollinators and, and specifically kind of around like the um, the mayor's pollinator pledge, which some of you likely know about. Um, and I know as you know, Connie was just talking about and, and, and uh, other people have talked about, there's a lot of great things around gardens in general going on around, around Columbia Heights. Um, and there seems to be a lot of enthusiasm for that push. So um, if you are a novice, it might not be the right one for you, but um, yeah, I'll just try to do my best to, to help you understand why um, planting specifically for insects uh, is very important and um, something that doesn't have to be really daunting, even if you're not really into plants or trees or anything like that. So just try to uh, help people recognize that <clears throat> you don't have to be an expert to do this sort of stuff. It's, it's something that we all can and, and should be doing to help save um, some of the ecology that we've lost. So um, that's my plug for it. Um, yeah, and thanks for listening. If you have any questions about it, I can feel free to answer them too. So. Oh, yeah, Connie? Well, I forgot one other community garden in our community. <laughs> and that's at the... Uh, um, uh, All Nations Church over by Silver Lake. They've just set up a whole new uh, permaculture type uh, garden. And I don't know all the specifics, but if they're interested, if it's closer in their neighborhood where they can uh, want to help, they can contact that church and uh, see when they, I think they work on Wednesday evenings, but I would call the church and double check. So that's another community garden set up for a similar to the concept we have at Lomiaki Park. Awesome. Thank you, Connie. Um, Raquel had a good point. You can also buy compost from the recycling center on Saturdays mornings. And uh, I believe that goes to a good cause, right, Veronica? I believe it's the, is it the key club that does the uh, compost bags? Oh, Veronica, you're muted. Sorry. Yes. Uh, yes. If you bring, uh, if you come to the compost uh, where we sent it on 3812 Main, I'm Madison, I mean, is the address of the Recycle Center. And by the way, I'm going to give a plug for the Recycle Center too, then, as long as you let me talk again. Um, we not only sell compost, then the Key Club kids are the ones who bag it and uh, sell it. And every, it's $3 for 20 pounds of compost, and the money goes towards a scholarship and other programs for the Key Club at Columbia Heights High School. But you also should be saving your plastic bags and your rigid styrofoam and get that out of the environment and get it to the recycle center. And any metal that you have, you have that old rake when you're gardening and you don't know what to do with that old metal rake that has a wood handle. We don't care if it still has a wood handle on, bring it in because we'll take the metal because we get money for the metal also for scholarships and programs. Also those fluorescent light bulbs, all those other things, keep them out of the environment, bring them to the recycle center in your oil, uh, tires off the rim, just look it up on the community, on the city website. Just about to throw that in since you asked. Sounds great, Veronica. Um, Kathy also mentioned in the chat, there's a community garden over in Wake Park, uh, just across uh, 37th at 36th and Johnson. Sometimes uh, they have spaces uh, open or uh, non-residents can apply um, and there's more details in the chat. Um, and then Adam, uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about the MWMO while you're here? Yeah, sure thing. Um, so the uh, Mississippi Watershed Management Organization. Um, oh yeah, and I see your question there, Kathy, sorry I missed that. Um, we are the local watershed management organization that occupies, um, uh, or I guess is given some of our power through Columbia Heights. So we're, we're it's called a joint powers government unit. Um, and that means that Columbia Heights, Fridley, the city of Minneapolis, uh, Minneapolis Park uh, and Recreation Board being its own unit of government, a little bit of St. Paul, a little bit of Lauderdale, all these communities give us some power to help protect um, water quality and habitat um, uh, in the areas where, where our watershed boundaries are. And if you're not sure what a watershed is, um, it's kind of like one big area of land where all of the water that falls on that drains towards one point in particular. Um, in our case, that would be the Mississippi River. Um, our watershed is 
kind of different because most of our watershed is very um, impacted by developments and concrete and buildings and that sort of stuff. So uh, whereas in a more natural system, you'd probably see a lot of rivers and creeks and, and um, you know, ponds and all that sort of stuff. We are kind of more of a, a pipe shed with only a few natural water bodies. Um, and so everything that falls onto the streets goes down into the storm drain system and into the river. And we just are here to help the cities protect um, water because uh, they're required by the government also to do some things to protect water too. So um, I see the question mentions grant programs. We do have some. Um, our uh, grant programs are basically wrapped up in terms of being able to apply this for funding for this year. Um, they'll start opening up again in um, in late or in fall for deadlines that are going to be in like November and December. So, but yes, we do help with all sorts of different stuff, um, big and small. Um, and I'm I'm here as a communications and outreach specialist. So, if any of you have any particular questions around water quality stuff you want to do. Um, ideas for projects, um, you know, if you have youth groups that you want us to get in, in contact with. Um, yes, the Adopt a Dream Challenge. Thanks for mentioning that, Veronica. <laughs> um, that's one that's going on now, too. A friendly competition between Columbia Heights, Fridley, Blaine, and Andover. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're trying to help support the push for that, too. So um, yeah, I'm just really happy to be here and, and connect with you all. And feel free to use me as a resource um, when it comes to stuff like that. So, um, Kathy asking about how you get involved with the adopt drain challenge. I, I assume that's what you're asking. Um, <clears throat> Veronica raised her hand there. She says, maybe contact her. I think <laughs> but, um, I, you can do <laughs> adopt a drain.org and you can actually name your Janes. I have two drains right here. I live on Jolly Lane and they're Mr. And Mrs. Jolly. And I had I took the I adopted the one on Lookout Place, and I call her Miss Looky Lou, and I talk to her every day when I walk by and pick something up. <laughs> great. That's great. Um, who's winning the competition so far? I'm pretty sure that it is Columbia Heights. Am I? Will do you know? Yay! Yep. Yep. I uh, believe we had 40 drains adopted uh, since uh, since the start of the program. I, I could be wrong though. I don't have the exact numbers off the top of my head, but uh, we went out uh, last week and got a photo with uh, uh, a winner, uh, resident Vanessa. She, she said, I believe she dropped, adopted seven drains. And so um, we got a photo with her and, and members of the community. So I'm uh, getting that up tomorrow actually. Um, so yeah, no, we're, we're really excited. Um, you know, that's something we want to promote uh, as well. So there's a drain in your neighborhood uh, or not even in your neighborhood, you know, somewhere in the city you want to go uh, help clean up, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, yeah, it's a great program and it's a, a, um, a good one for kind of these still pandemic-ish times. Hopefully we're getting um, out, out of it, but um, Kath, Kathy, to answer your question about what it involves is, it involves you going to that adoptdrain.org, registering for one at what drain you would like. Um, you have the option to name it. Um, and then from there, basically your adoption uh, means that you are willing to go out and sort of clear debris away from the storm drain. Um, usually this time of year, it's trash and maybe some leaves left over from, from uh, the fall and winter. Um, but, you know, um, in the, so there, there can be some lulls in it too, like midsummer, you might not find much at all. Um, and uh, but come fall, that's usually a big push for that program and one where it really is helpful to, to keep leaves and debris out of, out of the storm drain system, which when they enter waterways, um, they can be harmful to aquatic organisms by contributing to large algal growth and, and stuff like that. So if you come on Tuesday, I can tell you all about why that's a problem. <laughs> or if you just want to talk to me about it, I, I talk about it all the time, I guess. So... <laughs> When you say come uh, on Tuesday, Adam, is it in person or is it on, it's on Zoom? No, it's Zoom. It's Zoom. Yeah, we're not quite back to doing in-person events yet, but um, in July 26 actually is my first one scheduled and it's with uh, the Columbia Heights Library at the Rain Garden. So um, I can see you all in person then and I'm just now starting to feel the effects of my second vaccine that I got this morning. So <laughs> So it should be good. 
Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, uh, we did actually. Uh, Columbia Heights residents adopted 41 drains in March, and so we're we're super happy about that and super excited. We want to continue that momentum throughout the competition. Um, and then uh, we got a few more minutes here, Wes. Just tell us, uh, you know, if if uh, residents want to stop by the garden this summer, uh, say hi. What uh, you know? What's your schedule like? Uh, when do you have students out? If if you have students back out this uh, this summer. Yeah, so um, one thing that I that I wanted to mention was um, we're actually at Blooming Heights having a garden celebration in August, and um, I just put that information in the chat. Um, August 12th um, from 4.30 to 6 p.m. So the community is invited to that party where we'll have food. <coughs> Our high school <coughs> assistants will be there um, doing some pollinator education. Um, so it should be a really good time. Um, so that's one way you can come take a look at the garden. But also, like I said, it's open to the public. So you're welcome to just come look around. We've got signage talking about what a lot of the plants are. There's interpretive signage, um, you know, about different gardening systems within the garden as well that people can read and, and learn about. Um, and, you know, I'm out there every day of the week, um, Monday through Friday, you know, basically 7.30 until uh, 3.30 or 4. Um, you know, so if you're coming like during the week on a, um, on a weekday, you might run into me that way. We're oftentimes teaching programs. Um, so uh, it's, it's a busy place to be, but sometimes it's just a quiet day in the garden doing gardening work. So um, I encourage you to stop by and say hi. Um, I love to see residents come and check it out. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you very much, Wes. And uh, Kristen Stunkel put in uh, the website address for, for Blooming Heights in the chat. So, you know, if you get a chance, uh, come by and, and visit Wes and, and see the amazing things that they're doing up there. And um, I'll send out uh, Adam's information and Wes's information and um, the link for next week's uh, um, library program. And then um, we should have our summer newsletter out here in the next uh, few weeks. So uh, stay tuned as we plan our, our summer uh, schedule events. So um, I'd like to thank Wes once again, and thank everyone for, for attending tonight's uh, presentation. Thanks everyone for coming. Thanks everyone. Have a good night.